This video is sponsored by Brilliant.org. Stay tuned to learn more. Ah, this is the thing CSGO players blame their aim on. In other words, this is a server, and today I'm going to take it apart, take a look at its individual parts and explain how it works. Let's go take a look! First, we need to understand what this incredibly heavy piece of metal even is. This is a Dell PowerEdge R410, a rack server. A server is pretty much a computer that has more CPU cores, is optimized to run 24-7, has some fancy drive base and is extremely loud. So let's take a closer look at this thing. And from the top, it's not really all that much interesting, so we'll take a look at the front. There's a lot of interesting things at the front of the machine. First, there is a power button, then there is a VGA port for connecting your monitor, then we have an LCD screen. And this is very interesting and we'll get to it later because now the machine is not turned on. Then we have two USB 2.0 ports which are like for your keyboard and mouse when you need to debug something. Next we have this little tab which when we pull you can see a little name tag which contains the service tags and the service information and you can even put your own label here which is like for identification of the server. Next which is quite weird we have a DVD drive. And why do you need a DVD drive on a server? Well. Some operating systems, like Debian, are still meant to be distributed on DVD, and some service patches and some service utilities are also still distributed on DVD. And the other reason is that the server is pretty old, it's from 2011, which is, well, quite a long time ago. So that's the first row of the front panel covered, and on the second row we have this weird base, and inside of this base are hard drives. And yes, you heard correctly, hard drives. There are no SSDs from where this thing came from. And there's... Well, that's the front of the machine covered. So let's go take a look at the back. And the back isn't as pretty anymore, but it's still pretty interesting. First of all, we have an RS-232 port, which is used for all your serial applications. Next, we have something called iDRAC. And all you need to know for now is that you cannot use this LAN port inside your operating system. I'll explain how it works later on in the video. And then we have not one, but two wireless interfaces. Next, we have your basic PCI Express slot, which is just horizontal instead of vertical. And under it, we have this LED diode and this button. And these are connected to the LCD in front, and I will explain very shortly what they do. Keep that in mind, we will go back to this. And next are the power supplies. Yes, you are supposed to put two power supplies inside of this, but I have only one. Why would you want to put two power supplies inside of this? Well, for redundancy and for more power. You see, these are completely modular and you can replace them while the system is running because there will be always one powering the system. So if one, for instance, dies, you can just pull out the bad one, the second one will be still running and you can replace the first one with, with zero downtime. You can even hot swap the drives at the front the same way you can hot swap these power supplies. Well, that's all the interesting stuff on the outside, let's go take a look under the hood. But how do you even get under the hood? Well, you need to unlock this lock here, which you can do with a simple screwdriver. Now all you need to do is press this big black button, which you just unlocked, and pull the cover back. <laughs> and pull the cover back. And already you can see that this is not your average Dell machine. <laughs> but we can't really see much. What we need to do is remove all of these plastic shrouds. One off and the second off. The first thing you'll notice are these two huge heat things. And yes, there's two of them. This is a two CPU machine. But wait, CPU heatsinks usually have active cooling or fans on top of them. Well, that's another huge advantage of the rack system. You may think that cooling a literal slab of metal with two CPUs inside of it might be a bit hard, but it's actually quite simple. You see these vents on top of the hard drive base? Those are your intake, and the sucking is being done by these fans right here. But those are not your ordinary fans. Not only do they sound like a jet fighter about to take off, but they reach speeds of up to 16,200 RPM, which is 9 times faster than your average PC fan. And believe me when I say it, you can really feel the amount of air going through that machine. Next up, we can see two sets of RAM slots, which are currently filled with 16 gigs of RAM. Which really isn't a lot. It might sound like a lot to you computer people, but 16 gigs is nothing in the server world. That's why I got this puppy an upgrade. Let me present to you 128 gigs of RAM. 
And you are getting it. There. No one needs you. Well, now this puppy has got 128 gigs of RAM, which is, well, sufficient. But these, nor these, are your ordinary RAM chips. These are quite a bit different from what you put inside your computer. These memory chips are capable of some additional features you don't usually find in your typical RAM module. First of all, these are RDIM modules or registered DIM, which decreases electrical load on the memory controller by placing a register between it and the DRAM chips allowing it to manage more RAM modules, which is nice. Another feature which is not exclusive to servers, but it's used in servers all the time is ECC, also known as error correction code. These modules can correct single bit errors and are used in systems where not having any memory errors is crucial. Like, you know, servers. Next, we'll take a look at what this huge mess is. And this is only a PCIe Express card. To be precise, this is a RAID controller. And I'll explain what it does in a minute, but first let's take it apart. And there we go. This thing right here is a RAID controller. But what even is a RAID? In server applications and even in some desktop ones, we can take multiple drives and connect them into a RAID. You can then see your two drives as one drive. But what is that good for? Well, there's many RAID levels, but the most used ones are RAID 0 and RAID 1. RAID 0 is a so-called striped RAID, which means it splits the data between the drives massively increasing read and write speeds, but also increasing risk of losing data since you need only one drive to die on you to lose everything. RAID 1 is the exact opposite of RAID 0. It mirrors the two drives, meaning they both contain the same information. This RAID level doesn't boost performance, but it gives you redundancy, because you can have a dead drive and you still don't lose anything. What I have in my configuration is something else though. It's a RAID 10. This RAID level requires to have at least 4 drives, which I do, and mirrors 2 drives into a RAID 1 and then stripes the entire thing onto the remaining 2 drives, giving you speed and redundancy. This thing right here is your ordinary RAM chip. It holds cache for the disks, which means it preloads some of the stuff it has to read or write to make it a little bit faster. But let's move over to this right here. And I will have to pull it out of its place, which usually takes a while. Come out! Come out! Ah. There we go. Remember the LAN port I told you not to worry about? Well, this is the port. And the thing I'm holding in my hand right now is a little computer. It is, quite literally, a computer inside of a computer. This is something called iDRAC, and it's a remote management platform. You can actually log into it remotely and it allows you to control the system, control the fan speeds, monitor the temperatures, change some settings, change bio settings, and so much more. You can log into iDRAC with your web browser. But if you do that, be warned, you're going to get flashbacks into the dial-up era. Oh, this is not nice. Ah. Okay, that was easier than I expected. And then I'll just return its protective thingy. Good as new. <laughs> I think we covered all there is to cover in the back part, or I mean, all there is for a YouTube video. So let's follow the cables which go from the back to the front from the RAID controller, and we will arrive at the front. So the thickest cable right here is a SATA connection, which goes along to all of these drives, and it goes back to the RAID controller, which builds a RAID. Next up, we have this green circuit board, which has these two USB ports, which I use for things like vi a wireless mouse or a USB drive. It also contains the LCD screen itself, and it contains this button right here. And this button right here is the thing that lets the server know that the lid is open. And it has actually recorded the, ex the exact time when I open this lid, and it will let me know that someone has opened the lid by giving me an intrusion warning. And it basically says, hey, someone opened this, you may want to check what's inside new or what's changed, because someone, someone's, someone's been, been in here. here. And last but not least, we have your typical standard slimline DVD drive, which connects with your, you know, usual SATA connections. There's nothing much too interesting about this. I feel like that's all there is to cover about the inside. So let's close it up, let's turn it on and let's have some fun. And you can see that the LCD lit up even before I turned on the machine. That's because this machine is, well, always alive. If you unplug it, it's got its own batteries and it kinda knows what's happening at all times. Which is a little bit scary, but 
it does that. And the LCD screen can tell me things like the current power consumption, the current temperatures, I can set up what the home screen of the LCD is, and I can set up if the iDRAC uses DHCP or a static IP address and just so much more. But the interesting function of this LCD is this I button right here. This is called the System ID button. The reason why we even use the rack format is that we can stack multiple machines on top of each other in a rack cabinet to save space. Let's say you want to plug a cable from the back into the server, but you've got like 20 of these on top of each other. So what do you do? Well, you press this button and the LCD starts to blink. And now if you go around to the back, you can see that this LED diode right here is blinking as well so you can identify the server from both sides of the rack without having to count which server it is. The big moment of truth. Did it die on the operating table or did I manage to put it back together correctly? There's only one way to know. Hey, that sounds good. The first thing you may notice that this is a pretty loud machine. Let me put my microphone closer so you can really hear it. But this amount of noise is nothing compared to when you take the cover off, because then the fans go into overdrive, because you don't have that kind of cooling tunnel that you had before, so they have to cool as much as they can to keep the system cool. So let me show you how stupidly loud it gets when you open the lid while it's running. I don't know if you can hear me, but that's quite loud! Good, good, good. But now, let's go and install some operating system on it. It seems like, like I haven't broken anything yet, and yeah, we've got a boot screen. So, right now, what it's doing is it's performing a memory check. When this machine used to have 16 gigs of RAM, well, that screen right there was super fast, like, I don't know, 15-20 seconds max. But now that it has 128 gigs of RAM, now it has to do a lot more memory checking than it had to do before, so... This is going to take a while. Uh, wait! How am I going to install an operating system if I don't have the install media connected? Yeah, the memory check is going to take a while, so I'm going to get some coffee. Oh, I sure hope the memory check finished already. I wouldn't want to come back there with my coffee and realize it's still not done. Okay, have you finished? Still not! And this is your typical Debian installation, so let me just go through it real quick. Nothing amazing here. English, United States... Czechia! So, installation complete. Now I only remove the USB drive from which we installed and we can reboot. And wait again for the absolutely terribly long memory check. <sighs> Let me do some decorating in the meantime. Like this. And another car. Never ending memory check. Ah. And there we are. Okay, so now is the moment of truth. I've got the slab or the server running here with a Team Fortress 2 server running on it. Here is the console in Pterodactyl for that server. I'm connected to the server for now. I'm all alone. And here is the message that calls every single one of my thousand people on Discord to action. Ah, I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. Ah, let's go. Run! 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 I'm running! Run, run cowards! <laughs> no way! I... Ah! <laughs> jump down, jump down. No, I didn't no. even... I didn't <laughs> even land a single hit. Ah, the thing... Ah, the sniper on the tower again! <laughs> I just saw him in my peripheral vision for like a second and the very next thing I know is I'm dead! You are dead. Not big surprise. Not big. I have no idea, like, no idea how to do this thing. Ooh, Let's wait, see uh, if I can land a single kill with this. Is rocket jumping? Yes! What the hell was that? Oh. Ah. <laughs> At you first. Oh, I don't know who this pyro is, but they know what they're doing. But, no, I don't know what I'm doing. Wait, is Mini Stumpy really dominating me? Yeah, it's going to be either I kill him or I ban him. <laughs> 
Okay. Yo. <laughs> it's like... the first, it's not the ladder. <laughs> I came in like an. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Die! No! She oh. made this here we go. Oh. <laughs> I'm dead. Ah, let's go. I won. Do you want to learn how to do interesting things like I do on this channel? Chan then you should definitely go check out this video sponsor, Brilliant.org. Do you want to learn programming? Want to know what's happening inside your computer? Com catch up on your math lessons? Keep up with the ever-evolving world of computers? Then listen up, because Brilliant.org is the best way to learn math and computer science interactively. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from foundational and advanced math to AI, data science, neural networks and more, with new lessons added monthly. Whenever someone asks me how to learn programming, I always send them to learn Python, because it's a nice starting point to learn the logic of programming, which you can then take on to more complex stuff, like programming a PlayStation 1 game. Brilliant has got not only an amazing Python course which teaches you how to write code, but many other computer science courses which teach you how to think like a programmer. Thanks to their hands-on interactive lessons which help you visualize what you're learning and build analytical skills instead of brainlessly using formulas. Because Brilliant teaches you how to think. You can learn about algorithms, data structures, artificial intelligence and so much more. Try all of the amazing courses Brilliant has to offer for 30 days for free at brilliant.org slash bandwidth. Plus, the first 200 of you will get 20% off an annual subscription, and that's worth it. And that's all for today's video. I would like to thank to all of you who came to the Team Fortress 2 server, we had so much fun. If you want to join in on some gaming as well next time, all you need to do is join my Discord server, the link is here and here. Or if you want to play something with me right now, I have a long-running Minecraft survival server where I sometimes play. Huge thanks to my Patreons, especially to Jakub Dansbone, Johan Morgante, GoGetsDai, RetroReversing.com and Sergio Erupi. You guys rock! And that's it for today's video. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe or comment, I read all of your comments. But now, I need to make a horror game. Bye!